So given that we've, we've just ticked over um, the 7 o'clock, I think, I think we'll make a start in the interest of um, maximising our time uh, with Stefan. So on behalf of the Contemporary History Research Group, I'd really like to welcome Stefan Berger to, um, to join us and um, to, we're really looking forward to his paper. He's had a very brief um, kind of tour of Geelong and, and Geelong surrounds. We hope that there'll be occasion to see more of both uh, Deacon Geelong and also Deacon Bird one day. But delighted to have him come and present in the Contemporary History Seminar series. He's currently based at UTS um, for one month as a visiting fellow, and so it's terrific that he could come and join us. As you probably know, um, Stefan's work covers a number of fields, including historiography, um, including social movements. He's head of the Institute for Social Movements um, at the Rural University in Baltimore. And another area in which he specialises is the history of uh, or national history writing and its nexus with the phenomenon of nationalism in comparative context. And it's on that theme that he's going to speak to us today. Thanks very much, Stefan. Thanks very much, um, David. Yeah. Well, maybe um, by way of introduction, I should explain a little bit how I came to um, formulate such an uh, over-ambitious title uh, to look at the relationship between national history writing and national identity formation in global perspective. Um, I started, or well, my interest really in this connection um, started many years ago when I was still completing my PhD, which was on labor history. Um, but at that time, um, something happened which I found rather intriguing, namely German reunification uh, in 1990. And with German reunification, also a shifting of the way in which German national history was being told uh, by uh, historians. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's the time when I was beginning to ask myself, well, what actually is the relationship between national historical master narratives and uh, national identity and how does it change over time. Um, and uh, from there really um, I wrote a book on, on, on this topic for Germany, The Search for Normality. Uh, and then I asked myself, well, how does it look elsewhere? And uh, was trying to, first of all, develop a kind of European frame and horizon around this topic um, and then directed a European Science Foundation program on the writing of national history and national identity formation in Europe from the 18th century to uh, the present day, uh, which was the basis for the nine volume book series uh, Writing the Nation that uh, I did with uh, Palgrave Macmillan. Um, and um, one of the projects within that was then also to develop some kind of global perspective on, uh, on the topic and this will be what I'm talking about today to try and look at some of the uh, aspects in which uh, this relationship between national history writing and national identity formation um, has sort of global uh, themes to it. Okay, so far by uh, way of uh, introduction. Uh, now, uh, one, of the, um, one of the questions, if you like, um, in this relationship between historical writing and nation building is uh, to what extent uh, the origins of that relationship are, are European um, and what happened to it when it spread to other parts uh, of the globe with uh, various forms of colonialism and imperialism. As we will see in a minute, there has been quite a debate on how to kind of judge uh, this uh, transnational aspect of historical writing and nation formation. And of course, especially uh, ever since the powerful post-colonial critique by Deepesh Chakrabarti, uh, on provincializing Europe with his famous statement that sort of Europe was inadequate but indispensable. Um, we're still kind of uh, facing this problem 
Um, to what extent uh, is it a simple matter of uh, we have something that is of European origin that became a kind of European export article and was then adopted and adapted and transformed in various ways in different parts of the world? Uh, or can we actually also write a history of uh, history writing and nation building that starts from a kind of non-European uh, perspective? And of course, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, there are non-European conceptions of national history writing. In the Indian context, there are, for example, the kind of Kula Grantas, which, if I understand it correctly, is a form of kind of family, clan type uh, history. Uh, which is transmitted orally, um, so it's a sort of strong oral tradition that is related also to questions of memory. Kumkum Chatterjee has written about these uh, Kula Grantas. And in other parts of the world, in China, we also have a strong tradition of uh, forms of national history writing, Shima Chan in particular, mm -hmm. uh, where we have uh, very many different and sort of competing stories about uh, the national past emerging uh, incredibly early uh, if we compare it to, uh, to Europe. And the third, um, the third area um, where we have non-European conceptions of national history are, of course, the Creole nationalisms in Latin America, although there we already are faced with the problem how non-European they actually are, because uh, you have from early on there the um, transnational debates uh, between Spain, Portugal, uh, and the um, uh, originally Spanish or Portuguese colonies in, uh, in Latin America. So, um, this is, will be one of the kind of foci of uh, the talk to look at this kind of European, non-European relationship in national history writing and uh, national identity formation. Now, um, the question, of course, that I should also briefly address is uh, what do I understand by historical writing? Um, what kind of historical writing do we take into account? And uh, I will be focusing very largely on scientific historical writing, um, so something that emerges in Europe um, roughly in the course of the second half of the 18th century, um, where you have a kind of victory of uh, scientificity, um, a new way of looking at uh, history that emphasizes authenticity, emphasizes hard evidence, the development of source criticism um, at the universities, uh, in particular the um, uh, University of Göttingen in the second half of the 18th century becomes one of the uh, hubs of this uh, new form of uh, academy-based, university-based um, form of uh, scientific history writing, which of course, I mean, always when, always when you talk about origins, you have the problem that you can go further and further back in time. And a lot of the things that were sold as new, um, in particular then uh, at the University of Berlin by Leopold von Ranke in the early uh, 19th century, went back a lot further um, to, um, well, I guess a kind of tradition that is generally referred to as antiquarianism um, by the scientific historians of the 19th century, largely to discredit that tradition. But if you look at that tradition of antiquarianism, a lot of the elements that are then part and parcel of this new scientific history are already in place uh, with those, in inverted commas, antiquarianism. I guess the idea from the late 19th century onwards, um, late, late 18th century onwards, is that um, history becomes a kind of profession. It's, it's becomes, it has a kind of professional status that goes with a particular social status and a particular uh, cultural habitus. Um, so the, the, um, the university history uh, develops from there. And especially in trying to establish that professionalism, again, I guess it's important to realize that history as a subject at university only emerges in the course of the 18th century. Until then, it is very much, uh, if history is taught at all at universities, it is part of uh, a theology. 
uh, so history is a kind of sub-discipline of theology in European universities, and it only becomes a university subject in its own right in the course of uh, the 18th century. Uh, and this uh, establishment of a historical profession has a lot to do also with, first of all, claiming a particular status for historians. And the claiming of that status was framed around the question who could speak authoritatively about the past. And the historians were quite successful in the course of the 19th century to saying, well, we are actually the only ones who can speak authoritatively about the past. And everyone else, uh, including um, uh, people coming from literature or uh, novelists or people who were writing about history outside of the universities and academies, uh, they uh, can be classed as amateurs and their voice can be disregarded. Uh, so this sort of uh, very successful framing of their profession as the only one who can speak authoritatively about the past was the basis, I think, of the historicization of all art subjects in the course of the 19th century. And also if we look then, we have a kind of succession of uh, history wars. I mean, obviously in Australia you have your history wars, but uh, history wars is something that we have continuously really from uh, the 18th century, uh, and it's based on professional historians <laughs> claiming to speak uh, truthfully about the past and yet uh, being unable to find agreement on uh, what truthfulness about the past actually means. And that's the basis of a whole load of uh, history wars that we can trace a long way back um, in history. Now, um, I said before that uh, there is a sort of debate surrounding the question to what extent uh, this kind of historiographical nationalism uh, has European origins. That have basically been two positions, which for simplicity's sake we can restrict to two authors, Benedict Anderson and Pater Chatterjee. Um, Benedict Anderson, who's basically claimed that all non-European colonial nationalisms are derivative of a European model. So it's a kind of uh, idea that, uh, I guess, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, nationalism was very much invented um, um, and framed um, in Europe uh, and, you know, white settler colonies that of European origins, Latin America, obviously Latin America plays a big role in Benedict Anderson's book on uh, nationalism uh, and Pater Jatterji, who very much is response to Anderson's and then claimed that no, I mean, you actually have uh, nationalism in the colonial world is a kind of authentic expression of the colonized. Uh, and that what emerges there is something uh, uh, different, uh, qualitatively different from um, the European forms of, uh, of nationalism. In fact, what we see if we look at a lot of colonial nationalisms is that all of the colonial nationalisms have deep problems or considerable problems with historical time and the question of how ancient the nation is. Because in, in the European nationalisms, one of the uh, big themes in historiographical nationalisms has always been to trace the nation as far back as possible in time. Uh, usually they got, get lost in the midst of time at, uh, at some point, but the longevity of the nation was seen as an important part of, if you like, the quality of nations in Europe and in colonial nationalisms that often was a problem. So you had various strategies of dealing with this. You could borrow uh, the past from an alleged motherland, uh, for example, uh, in Argentina, uh, where you have the notion that, in fact, Argentina is a kind of new Spain, um, and that we prolong the history of Argentina backwards by adapting the history of Spain as part of the history of Argentina. You could also um, construct the past by using the indigenous population, uh, the First Nations. Uh, Mexico would be such an example. Mexico is actually divided historiographically because you have, a, similar to Argentina, the notion of the new Spain. Uh, but you also have a different historiographical tradition which actually says that uh, it is uh, a kind of the indigenous population which forms a kind of historical tradition of Mexico and by adapting that kind of past to the national past of Mexico you get a kind of authentic Mexicanness derived from that experience. 
You also have a third option uh, represented by the United States. Uh, Benjamin Franklin there once famously said that uh, the United States is a nation without ancestors. Uh, so you simply deny the importance of a long past. You say this is maybe something that you know maybe Europeans thought important, but we don't think this is important at all. Uh, we are self-consciously uh, a young nation, a new nation, and we think there's a lot of advantages to be had from rejecting that kind of long past. But generally speaking, and Gerard Bouchard and his comparison of uh, colonial nationalisms has pointed this out, uh, generally speaking, in all of the colonial nationalisms, you have a very prominent part that is played by metissage and by hybridity um, uh, in constructing forms of national identity through history writing in colonial and post-colonial nationalism. Uh, if we come back from here for a moment to the European origins of that relationship between historical writing and historical nationalism, again, we can say that there have been proto-national histories in uh, medieval and early modern Europe, especially if we look at the narratives, if we look at many of the tropes and the ideas about national history, in European national history writing, we find that many of these narratives are already present in medieval and early modern uh, Europe and in the kind of chronicles and uh, history writing that is going on in medieval and early modern Europe. So um, it's not necessarily the case that, um, that, that the narratives are emerging completely um, from scratch in the 18th century. Nevertheless, adapting an idea by Reinhard Koselleck, uh, if we think about the um, European century between 1750 and 1850 as a kind of bridge period uh, in, uh, in European history, a bridge period between the kind of pre-modern and the modern, um, then something substantial happens uh, in that period. Uh, we find, if you like, the uh, emergence of a new sense of scientificity, in particular in historical writing that I've just outlined, with the emergence of history as a scientific subject from the late 18th century onwards. And we also find a kind of new notion of nationalism and national identity, in particular with the dual revolutions in the US and in France in the late 18th century, where you have, uh, for the first time, nation defined as, if you like, a very inclusive concept of all people living in a bounded territory, whereas a lot of the definitions of nation, nationers, nationality in pre-modern times was very much restricted to um, parts of the elite of uh, a particular place. We also have in that period the idea that uh, national history writing is tied to modernity and to modernizing processes. So uh, national history writing becomes a way of reinforcing or establishing the belonging of a particular place to modernity or the development of modernity in a particular place. Uh, all of that is done with a particular theoretical and methodological framework, which I refer to as scientificity. So the, the, the forward march of that scientific, scientificity is very uh, noticeable. Um, there are a number of other uh, characteristics, I think, of the emergence of uh, national history writing and its relationship to national identity uh, that are worth just briefly touching upon. There is, for example, the uh, strong gendering of national histories, uh, which uh, we can also trace back to uh, the 18th century. Um, in, in very basic terms, the idea that um, uh, your nation is generally set up with kind of male characteristics, uh, whereas uh, other nations, usually nations that uh, are referred to as counter opposite uh, to your own nation, uh, are generally feminized. Uh, so there is a, a strong gendering of national history uh, going on, which is a, is a sort of red thread that runs through national history writing into the, into the 20th and 21st uh, centuries, with very, very few exceptions. The only exception that we found in the project was um, um, the Habsburg uh, Empire, uh, which in the 19th century in particular, after 
um, after 1866 um, is uh, a case of uh, self-feminization. It often uh, describes itself in very feminine terms, but the explanation for this is ultimately quite simple because um, the Habsburgs lost the war against Prussia in 1866, uh, it was a kind of German civil war in the 19th century, and um, the Prussians are very much depicted by Austrian history writing in a kind of male, in a kind of aggressive kind of male um, way, and therefore the only way to describe themselves then was in a kind of feminine way, which, which they do rather consistently in the second half uh, of uh, the 19th century. Uh, you also have, uh, in the course of the 19th century, an increasing merger of um, local and regional with national history writing, uh, where sort of the local and the regional could potentially emerge as other to national history writing, as an alternative to national history writing. In fact, it gets very much subsumed under national history writing, so the local and the regional become building blocks of the nation. Um, they're, not, they're not an opposite to the nation, but they become integrated into uh, national history writing. Um, and, um, um, well, there are a number of other things which I think for time reasons I, I won't go, go uh, into here now. If we if we move now from the kind of European uh, scene to uh, a kind of global perspective, um, and apologies for uh, being rather broad about uh, those perspectives, um, if we move to, to North America, one of the things that we see here is um, a very strong transfer of uh, historist uh, ideas or I use the word historist, um, although I know that in the English language the word historicist is more common, but uh, it's one of the few cases where English is actually more imprecise than German, uh, because uh, you, know, you have this uh, different versions of historicism, one connected to Ranke and one connected to Popper, and they're actually very different ideas of uh, historicism, therefore it's better, I think, to have two words for, for those things rather than one word. Um, Anyway, so we have this strong transfer of historist ideas in the 19th century, uh, gets adopted, adapted, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Gela Lindelbach has written a wonderful book about this transfer between Europe and America in uh, the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century then, of course, we see alongside the rise of the US to a global superpower, also the rise of American universities to a position of dominance in the 20th century. It means they're playing a leading role also in the development of the subject uh, of professional historical writing. Um, the number of uh, important things about uh, the US, which finds in a way no, um, no equivalent um, in much of European history writing, it very much depends whether you see Russian uh, history as part of European history, uh, because in Russia, like in the US, you will have the very important notion of the frontier, uh, which in, uh, in the US is connected to uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's work and uh, his idea that, if you like, the American spirit, American national identity very much emerges out of that kind of frontier experience, which is not a notion very common in, um, in, in Europe, simply because of the lack of frontiers, with the exception, as I just said, of, uh, of, Russian, of Russia. Uh, the other important element that goes into historical writing is the Protestant um, origins of the US, uh, the, the, the Pilgrim Fathers, uh, the kind of Protestantism that becomes part of that kind of waspish identity uh, in the US, and that is kind of, re is kind of reinforced then by Max Weber's famous uh, notion of the Protestant ethic, uh, the um, con conjuncture of Protestantism and capitalism that uh, finds its most obvious um, expression, according to Weber, in, uh, in the US. There are kind of uh, pockets of uh, exceptionalism, of course, in, in North America, in particular the story of Quebec, 
the framing of Quebec uh, as a kind of uh, Catholic place, uh, the kind of get with the Gallic spirit, uh, the impact of Catholicism, which also means a kind of self-conscious rejection of that story of modernity that is such a prominent part of the uh, North American narrative, both in the US and in Canada. And Quebec is quite a different way of framing its, in inverted comma, uh, commas, national histories. Another prominent thing in North America is obviously the issue of race uh, and, uh, and, and class, uh, which uh, does find uh, echoes in, um, in, in Europe, but in particular um, the, uh, the issue of race becomes a, a big stumbling block of the kind of national narrative of the US in uh, the 20th century. If we look uh, further south, Latin America, the, the first thing to say here is probably um, the uh, incredibly early professionalization and institutionalization of national history writing, which uh, rivals Europe. This is in line with Benedict Anderson's idea of Latin America being, in a way, the birthplace of kind of modern uh, nationalism. Um, Göttingen is sort of the um, 1770s, 1780s, the Humboldt University then the kind of 1810s, 1820s, but it's in a way not far behind that we find in Chile in the 1830s and 1840s um, um, thorough institutionalization and professionalization of history writing, often connected to uh, national history writing with a very close relationship towards uh, European uh, institutions. That, again, the transfer of ideas between Europe and Latin America is probably as prominent as the transfer of ideas between Europe and North America uh, in the 19th century and even earlier than in North America. Uh, the major role in national history writing is very soon then occupied by the various independence struggles and the uh, post-independent struggles of forging national identities on the Latin American continent. Um, there are uh, a variety of different peculiarities about Latin American history writing. Um, the, the notion of the Pampas in Argentinian history writing, the notion of racial fusion uh, in Brazil, the importance of the mestizos in, uh, in Mexico, uh, they all have very distinct ways of of branding their national history uh, writing. Brazil is perhaps the most interesting, this notion in a highly kind of racialized um, context that uh, the unique thing about Brazil is that it emerges out of a fusion of the white, largely Portuguese uh, settlers uh, with the uh, slave population and the indigenous population. And the uniqueness of Brazil is made out of the idea that it is this fusion uh, that produces that uniqueness. But I think ultimately uh, there's such a big disconnect between this, uh, this um, myth of origin in the kind of national historical writing and the actual social situation on the ground until today in, in Brazil that uh, it always uh, was a kind of problematic uh, foundational story, I would uh, argue. All of the Latin American countries constantly position themselves towards the uh, larger colonial powers of the region, so notions of Hispanidad and uh, notions of a kind of Lusophone identity, uh, and how to negotiate the kind of independence of separate national historical narratives with a belonging to Hispanidad or, or kind of Lusophone, the, the Lusophone world becomes a kind of um, almost kind of perennial problem for those uh, national uh, histories. And the other big thing in Latin America is the positioning towards Catholicism. Uh, Catholicism becomes part and parcel of uh, national identity across uh, Latin America. And um, to what extent we then see a kind of struggle between a lysist-oriented professional history writing that was also very prominent in Spain and in Portugal, uh, and a kind of more popular, if you like, uh, amateurish Catholic tradition um, is also an, an, an interesting theme in the national historiographies of uh, Latin America. The next bit is, uh, for me, the most difficult one, because I assume you know most of, much more about this than, than I do. Uh, if we uh, look to, uh, towards Australia, I think one of the striking things here is the 
strong ties to Britishness uh, before the First World War. Um, you know, actually, no notions of a separate Australian history, as far as I'm aware, uh, before 1914. What is being taught and uh, what is being sort of understood as Australian history is largely a kind of British uh, history, and then you have the uh, First World War as a kind of foundational event and the emergence of a notion of Australianness in uh, the interwar period around ideas of mateship and uh, egalitarianism, um, which uh, I understand become kind of foundational myth of uh, Australianness. Um, and then um, a kind of critical turn only in the post Second World War period with historians such as Keith Hancock and Manning Clark. Um, who are beginning to problematize a lot of the um, myth uh, around uh, Australianness and Australian national identity, and uh, also beginning to kind of um, write a more critical form of history, um, which uh, is then kind of met by a kind of nationalist backlash, which is very much a kind of public historical backlash associated with uh, politics. Um, um, by uh, Jeffrey Blaney and uh, Keith Winchard. It's actually, I mean, as far as I'm aware, it's only these two, really. I mean, I've never heard any other name uh, in connection with this. Uh, and both of them, of course, uh, do not seem to be representative at all of a kind of wider academic culture uh, in Australia. So you have a lot of academic historians in Australia who seem to follow in the footsteps of this kind of earlier critical historiography. Um, but because of the in a way, the politics attached to um, notions of uh, Australian national history, um, uh, in particular uh, in uh, the 80s and 90s, uh, you do have this incredible attention that is given to uh, those two historians and their particular revisionist uh, ideas. I think it remains probably, uh, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, one of the biggest issues in Australian history, how to locate Australian history within a kind of broader Asian uh, context. Um, I mean, my understanding very much is that uh, it was also a political agenda under Paul Keating to do precisely that, to locate Australia more in Asia, and um, how it would then, in a way, produce this kind of, or in a way, capitalize on the fact that many white Australians seem to be very unhappy uh, with this notion of locating Australia in Asia, and therefore uh, this whole historical revisionism was underpinning also the political project uh, of the Liberal Party uh, here in Australia. And, and I don't think whether we've moved anywhere uh, from there, or whether this was still pretty much the kind of battle lines uh, that uh, we find ourselves in, 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 in this part uh, of the world. If we move to Asia, it's very difficult to talk about a large part of the continent of Asia in, in sort of uh, one slide. Um, we obviously here have the interesting case of Japan. Um, Japan, which is the only country um, in the non-West becoming an, in effect part of the West and developing its own form of colonialism and imperialism and its own form of national history writing that um, underpins this, or these, these projects of westernization and uh, colonialism. And uh, in fact, this kind of uh, new history writing uh, is replacing the old Sinocentric worldview in Japan. Very important, again, is the process of adapting, of learning from the West in particular, um, uh, from uh, from Germany, the Japanese are also known as the Prussians of the East in the 19th century. Uh, so a lot of not only in historiography and in, in all in many areas of life, they're adapting ideas from from um, Prussia and Germany, which kind of, if you look at Europe in the late 19th century, it makes sense because it is by far the most successful European nation in the late 19th century, engaged in this rapid catching up process. Uh, it overtakes Britain as first industrial nation of uh, Europe just before the First World War. And it seems this incredibly dynamic, um, modern place for many people who look at Germany before uh, 1914. And that is exactly what Japan does. Introduces um, historians such as Ludwig Ries, who is a uh, pupil of uh, Leopold von Ranke, um, establishes kind of uh, Western forms of history writing at the University of Tokyo. 
uh, in the 19th century, uh, sort of commissioned textbooks on how to write history, most famously by Gustav Zerfi, uh, Habsburg um, a scholar um, in the 19th century. This establishes a kind of historiography office uh, which was there to glorify kind of Meiji rule, obviously it's still very new in the second half of uh, the 19th century, so there is a strong notion of a kind of official historiographical nationalism promoting the idea of modernity and national history pretty much along the lines that it was also done in Europe in the 19th century. And you have uh, very many debates uh, find sort of a kind of mirror in, in Japan. So you have, for example, uh, also the uh, debates um, that you find in Europe between traditional forms of historism and uh, positivist history writing, Herbert Spencer, Thomas Buckle, they are also received in Japan and produce in Taguchi Ukichi uh, a kind of own positivist version of history writing that is arguably far more successful in Japan uh, than it is in Europe, where the traditional historicist mode becomes, uh, or very much remains the dominant mode and sidelines any notions of kind of positivist history writing in the 19th century. The reactions in Korea and China are um, uh, also very strong. Um, so, in a way, both, uh, I mean, Korea becomes a J Japanese colony, of course, um, with strong attempts of Japan to integrate in Korea into a kind of, um, um, not only a Japanese empire, but in a way making it Japanese. The nearest example in Europe is probably uh, Algeria and France, the way in which uh, Algeria is well on its way of becoming a French ordinary French département uh, in, um, in uh, the early parts of the 20th century. Um, so we have new developments, especially new Confucianism, um, which uh, relate to this kind of westernization of an understanding of history and an understanding of framing uh, national uh, identity. The new text school in China becomes very very important here, and it is on the basis of this attempts to become as scientific as the kind of European models that also the various Marxist forms of history writing uh, in uh, East Asia start off. That's true of Japan, but that's also true uh, of, uh, of, of China and of Korea. So if you like, the Maoist national histories, and uh, also by extension includes North Korea, uh, who merge the national and the class narratives do so in a kind of Marxist uh, historiographical frame that uh, also is very much uh, adopted from European models. Um, India has a very different trajectory uh, to that of uh, the far east of Asia. Um, we have here the early emphasis, of course, most of the institutions in India, most of the scientific institutions have been founded in some way, shape or form by the British uh, in uh, the 19th century. Um, and we have a kind of long way of the kind of it, in, independentist, uh, nationalist history writing that ultimately feeds into the kind of Congress uh, and is still arguably the dominant form of history writing in India. Uh, today, um, um, if you look at um, um, the kind of uh, national history that is produced uh, by, say, the Mukherjee's in, uh, at JNU uh, today, uh, they've written this big two-part uh, history of India published with Penguin. Uh, it is a straightforward kind of Congress nationalist uh, narrative of the uh, development of, uh, of India. Um, we then, of course, have also the, the rise of subaltern studies in India in the 1980s, um, uh, kind of, um, so the, the whole sort of post-colonial uh, idea which uh, emerges from there and um, it comes from a kind of Marxist, strong Marxist uh, tradition. Um, um, Deepesh Chakrabarti is an interesting example uh, there, how he develops from strong Marxist positions to adopting more post-structuralist uh, ideas and uh, his book, Provincializing Europe, is this kind of fusion of uh, you know, Marx meets Heidegger, really, uh, um, trying to frame this, uh, all of this in a, in a, a post-structuralist um, worldview. And of course, more recently, we've seen the construction of a Hindu uh, nationalist uh, past, in particular under the under the Modri government, with strong opposition from academic history writing, Romina Tapa, the 
um, the famous uh, historian of ancient India, um, has been particularly prominent in critiquing this uh, Hindu nationalist narrative that is promoted by uh, by uh, the government. But again, if you look at the history of communalism, you can trace that a long way back. And again, you know, like, uh, like with everything else in the British Empire, it's usually the British who are to blame. Uh, the uh, constructions of Hinduism and Islam begins in British colonial historiography in the 18th century. Usually the one is played off against, uh, against uh, the other. Um, again, I'm running out of time, so I will, I will uh, not talk about uh, the Second World War, which also has a very interesting historiographical relationship to um, national identity in, in Asia. Uh, finally, I think um, if we look at, um, at Africa and, and, and the Middle East, um, we have in the second half of the 19th century um, strong forms of Arab nationalism emerging, uh, which tend to be cultural forms of nationalism centered around issues of language and uh, literature. Uh, Birke Schäbler has uh, worked on this, uh, and we have, uh, if you like, um, this early form, these early forms of nationalism, um, very important, are again people coming from Arab nations who are studying usually in, um, in uh, the West, in, in Europe or in North America, uh, and who then bring back these ideas of cultural nationalism and are actually addressing mm, not so much, if you like, the in inverted commas, their own people, but the kind of Western um, colonizers with uh, these ideas. And then there is a shift only in the 40s and 50s, exemplified by the writings of someone like Mohamed Shafiq Rubal in uh, Egypt, uh, where uh, these um, intellectuals who write history uh, address Arabs, address in a way their own people, and, and develop a kind of mass mobilization of nationalism uh, in uh, their own countries. Very interesting is then the experiments a little bit later uh, with uh, this merger of socialism and nationalism that is associated in particular with Nasserism, um, and it is the failure of that particular vision of a modernizing nationalism under the flag of socialism that uh, leads to the leads directly to the rise of Islamism um, in uh, or from the kind of 1980s uh, onwards, and the um, religion really replaces the kind of nation as the key um, form of uh, identification throughout much of the uh, Arab world. Um, perhaps just briefly on uh, Africa. Africa is of course traditionally seen from a Western point of view. I mean, Hegel, Hegel famously said, "This is the history. Uh, this is the continent without history." Uh, so uh, the idea of the European idea was that Africans were living in a kind of eternal present. There was no kind of historical uh, development uh, there. And that was, of course, a European legacy that um, African history had to very much try to overcome and did so with a variety of different projects of historical writing, usually tied also to uh, national identity uh, formation. We see this particularly prominently with Leopold Senghor Senghor um, in Senegal, um, where you have the strong development of a Senegalese national history, but it is from early on also tied to notions of Pan-Africanism. So uh, the national and the transnational get merged in interesting ways in different uh, schools of African history writing. One of the most famous ones is the Dhaka School of History writing with the foundational figure of Chaik Anta Diop. Uh, who is particularly well known for his search of uh, African civilizations, his writings on Black Athene, uh, the, in a way the African origins of uh, Greek uh, historical culture, and his work on the pharaonic civilizations, the ancient Egyptians as Black Africans. So we see here a variety of different historiographical attempts to, in a way, move towards foundational stones of a kind of Pan-African uh, identity. I leave the last two points also because I'm, I'm talking for too long. Uh, finally, uh, by way of conclusion then, perhaps a brief reflection on um, where are we in terms of these kind of global national histories. Well, I think if my um, very sort of broad overview of developments uh, is correct, then 
uh, with uh, reference to our initial question, how European are actually the origins of global history writing, we would have to say they're very European. Um, you know, I would come down much more on the side of Anderson rather than Pater Chatterjee. Um, and I can't really see that there is a qualitative difference uh, simply by the way that you know, he's framing them as the kind of voices of the oppressed. Uh, I think in terms of structure, I think in terms of narrativity, uh, I think in terms of institutionalization, it looks to me very much like adaptations of uh, a Western a European model. And that also goes, if you like, for the Janus faceness of um, these uh, historiographies. Because on the one hand, I think these historiographies that are tied to national identity formation, they can be incredibly liberating. Uh, they have strong anti-feudal elements, they have strong anti-absolutist elements, they're tied to liberal democratic participatory forms of politics, they can be anti-colonial and anti-imperial, and they have given voice to national minorities. So there is a kind of emancipatory aspect to these national forms of history writing, but at the same time they can also be incredibly oppressive, they further xenophobia. Uh, they, they feed off the distinction between internal and external enemies. Uh, they have contributed to wars and to genocide in many parts uh, of the world. Um, so uh, this kind of Janus face character of national history writing underpinning national identities seems to be also a kind of global characteristic of that relationship that's very prominent in Europe but also equally prominent in non-European scenarios. And I think I leave it at that and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Stefan, for a presentation of um, tremendous breadth and texture and also for capacity to, to swoop down into case studies of depth mm -hmm. as well. It's a, yes, it, you can tell that there's a multi-volume um, <laughs> project behind uh, this kind of presentation. Um, I'm going to now open the, the floor to questions, and I should also note um, for others' benefit that we are recording to um, this presentation. Uh, in the tradition that we um, normally abide by, I'll throw first to Bill, please, for questions, comments. Um, Stefan, thanks very much. Chris Ward is here from Burwood. Um, with you, just a couple of, um, I guess, critiques or thoughts thrown at you. Uh, with your, are you writing here about um, historians who are servants of the state, whether directly employed by the state, or we brought that out to include the universities? So I was thinking in the um, Antipodean tradition, um, uh, are you, for example, if we looked at New Zealand and the Maoris, the Maoris would have considered themselves a nation. They signed a treaty with the British, the Treaty of Waitangi. They have their national history, yes, it's an oral tradition in other forms, etc. Um, so there's that, um, that, you know, and then there are the historians, I would say, you know, that in coming from the working class, etc., um, who see themselves as opposed to the state or whatever. Is that a, a fair thing? To, to the, how you're categorising your authors and writing of national history, that sort of the dissidents to the nation are in whatever form, whether they're an indigenous critique or working, uh, are excluded from your analysis? Was that unfair? Um, no, I, th I don't think they're excluded. I mean, I have worked myself with the notion of kind of oppositional narratives and status narratives. Uh, and historians can sometimes subscribe to oppositional narratives and sometimes to status narratives. Um, so it very much depends on, uh, on where you are looking. Uh, and um, I mean, the, I was focusing very much on the kind of scientific history writing because I would argue that in the course of the 19th century it becomes uh, the only form of history writing that um, is uh, authenticating a variety of different political projects. Um, so um, the scientificity becomes the hallmark of quality and therefore any kind of political project that wanted to use history writing also needed to use the professional historians. Uh, in order to, uh, to um, give credit to whatever political project they were trying to implement. Uh, this changes a little bit around um, 
around uh, the late 20th century again when we see in some respects a kind of crisis of that professionalism in the historiography. In fact, I've written a piece a couple of years ago where I compared the state of the historical profession around 1800, around 1900 and around 2000. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we can see around 1800 the formation of that kind of class, self-declared class of professional historians, uh, which was at their height around 1900, and around 2000, I think we see a massive crisis of that, and therefore also an interesting blurring against, a blurring again between professional and, in inverted commas, amateur historians, um, which are moving closer together because the historians are not so sure anymore that they are the only ones who can speak truthfully uh, about uh, the past. But the, the project as a whole doesn't exclude them, and perhaps I can give the example of the tradition of uh, working class socialist historical writing, which very much emerges in Europe outside of the academy. Uh, it's actually emerging within the labor movements of the 19th century. They also produce the uh, often autodidactic uh, labor historians who write the history of the organized labor movement in the 19th century. Um, we find them almost anywhere. We can think of in Germany, obviously, uh, Eduard Bernstein. Uh, in France, uh, Jean Jaurès. Uh, in Italy, uh, Filippo Turati. In Switzerland, Robert Grimm. Uh, and I think we can go around the countries and find them, find them everywhere. They never had an academic position. Um, and the way in which these um, labor movement historians were integrated in the academy looks very differently across different European countries. In Britain, arguably, it was very early. You already have them occupying important positions in the academy in the interwar period. If you think of people like G.D.H. Cole uh, in Oxford. Uh, in Germany, they get completely excluded uh, from the academy until after the Second World War. And it is only in the 1950s and 1960s that labor history becomes a kind of academic university subject in West Germany, uh, at least. But if we, if we look at the way that these early, these 19th century labor historians coming out of that autodidactic tradition, how they frame labor history, it is intriguingly also almost exclusively in national terms. So if you like, their kind of class perspectives on historical writing are subsumed also very successfully under the national perspective. I mean, this had a lot to do with the fact that these labor movements were operating in nation states. And, you know, the, the, their first addressee was the nation state. And therefore, they also begin to write labor history in national frameworks. I mean, that's one of the intriguing things about national history writing, I think, the way it becomes so successful and so powerful, in particular in that century between 1850 and 1950, because it is able to subsume all other forms of history writing under the national or adapt all other forms of history writing to the national, whether it's spatial or non-spatial, whether it is local or regional or transnational, or whether it is class or religion or ethnicity or culture or race, uh, it all very successfully becomes subsumed under the national. And I think that is the, the power of the national historical narrative. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Stefan. Other questions? Comments? Still, my name is Philip, if I may. I I find the, the Janus space uh, metaphor quite intriguing, particularly if we talk about that uh, along with the uh, crisis in the historical profession around the 2000s of sort of outside amateur historians and so forth. Uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, when you think about historical narratives being used to reinforce contemporary political and divisive agendas. Um, one of the difficulties you say have in sort of Russia, Ukraine, places like this, is that you have people sort of standing on the fringes of the academy who often provide politicians with uh, the types of divisive historical narratives necessary to legitimate their sort of contemporary political claims, whilst those inside tend to be a bit more circumspect and so forth. So in what sense do you see the uh, divisions in the historical profession sort of play out with regard to this gender space, uh, capacity of history to both legitimate of violence and, and so forth, but also to liberate uh, uh, other things as well. Yeah. Well, I think, um, uh, I guess, ultimately, 
all it's very difficult to uh, have it's probably impossible to have uh, any form of historical writing that doesn't have a normative dimension. Mm -hmm. And in some respects, all historical writing starts from that normative dimension. And of course, one of the successes of establishing the um, sci scientific history writing in the 19th century was to make people believe that it was possible to have a non-normative form of history writing that was legitimated purely through a particular methodology uh, and uh, theoretical framework. You know, uh, Ranke's famous statement that he wants to extinguish himself mm -hmm. and live in the past. Well, you know, that's clearly uh, not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but it was the basis of establishing that, you know, historians would speak truthfully about the mm -hmm. past regardless of normative perspectives. But if we accept the fact that all history writing in a way starts from broadly normative conceptions, then it also means that you have divisions within the historical profession, and that's where I think also the contestations about national history come from, because you don't have a national history writing anywhere in the world that has not been contested. So although you have this scientific notion that historians are there to establish the truth about the past, um, in fact, the national past never comes in just one version. Even, you know, you could argue, for example, that in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, British national history is remarkably homogenous and unified as a national historical narrative. Uh, at the other end is probably German historiography, which is remarkably divided um, in the 19th and 20th century and contested. Um, but even there you have contestation. You know, you have different uh, notions of Englishness underpinning by different uh, historical writings. We think, for example, of Seeley's writings on the Greater Britain um, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, and um, um, Green's writing on uh, English national history. You have a kind of Little Englander and a kind of uh, imperialist vision of England, which are very different conceptualizations of national history and its impact on national identity formation. Uh, and th these contestations are there everywhere, I think. And that's also, if we move it to the more contemporary period, if we move it to, uh, to Eastern Europe, I think is what we're seeing there. We're seeing often very state-driven uh, attempts to direct uh, national history and to find allies amongst the historical profession, but it's invariably always contested. Uh, and in a place like Poland, for example, this is very interesting because with every change of government you have a change of museum directors and uh, directors of the academy change and uh, you have sort of constant fluxes, if you like, uh, depending on, on who's, in, uh, who's in government. Um, you know, the, uh, one good example, recent example, I think, is the Museum of the Second World War in Gdansk, which uh, was this kind of showcase museum under the the old uh, liberal uh, government, um, which uh, was trying to counter this strong Polish emphasis on Poland in the Second World War by globalizing the Second World War. And as soon as peace uh, uh, come, comes into government, uh, they uh, change the name of the museum, which for them, then is the pretext for exchanging the museum director. And the new museum director now is reintroducing this Polish focus. Yeah, no, thank you. It's also interesting that a lot of my colleagues who are sort of within that profession uh, often complain that uh, those on the outside that find allies with um, politicians, even on the inside that find allies with politicians, um, are able to write much more uh, sort of engaging histories that are read by the public in comparison to theirs. Mm -hmm. So the impact on shaping uh, or, or, or sort of disseminating national history to beyond the academy is much greater. And that's often a cause for concern for them, for their, for their sort of diminishing relevance in their sense, yeah. beyond the academy. True, true. Yeah. Sadly, folks, we probably have to wind up there, which, um, which I'm really sorry about, because um, I think we could be talking for yeah. many, many more hours, if not days, in terms of doing justice to the questions that you prompted with such a, an expansive and stimulating presentation, Stefan. So on behalf of all of us, thanks very much again. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to Bird, um, and I think Klaus was with us for some time, and we'll look forward to seeing you again at the same time next week. I think we have Richard Hi. Trem, Trem, Richard Trembath joining next mm -hmm. next time. Bye.
Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, well, I've got the group. Yeah.